Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Cause you make me feel alive. I've been locked out of hell. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. At UBNRadio.com. It's time for the Bonnie Cher Show, a whirlwind of wit, wisdom, celebrity, and the boomer life. With a little bit of this, and a lot of that, and so much more you don't want to miss, here's Bonnie! Well, hello, and uh, welcome old friends and new from near and afar. I'm your host, I'm Bonnie Shear, and I'm here to guide you through the worlds of entertainment, the great boomer generation, and of course, the world of type 1 diabetes. Um, thank you for tuning in, and please feel free to share your thoughts. You can call in at 1-323-843-2826, or you can tweet the hashtag B S H E R radio. Now, before we get the show on the road, I'd like to acknowledge jazz great Wayne Cobham for my super duper hero theme song. And uh, while I'm at it, let me also acknowledge Corey Bowen of Crown and Anchor Jewelry. Um, You can visit him on Etsy.com, or you can find him on Twitter, um, to get more information about the pieces that he allows me to wear on the show for this promotional message. Makes great stuff. When we come back, musical director, composer, arranger, and pianist, my gosh, Um, that's Alex Ryback, and... uh, Back in 30 seconds. Every child deserves to feel safe. Love Cures, a benefit of healing for the abused child's soul. At Symphony Space in Manhattan, June 26th. Starring Broadway World Award winner, Julie Budd. Featuring Broadway performers and special guests, including the Young People's Chorus of New York City. Director, Tony Award winner, Wayne Salento. Proceeds to the New York Center for Children. Learn about Love Cures or buy tickets, symphonyspace.org, because every child deserves to be safe. Alex Rybeck is a musical director, he's a composer, he's an arranger, he's a great guy, and best known for his work in concerts and uh, recordings, and of course in the theater. Uh, Alex's Broadway credits include Merrily We Roll Along, directed by Hal Prince, and Grand Hotel, directed by Tommy Toon. So, uh, hi, Alex. How you doing? Hi, Bunny. So nice to hear that voice. I'm great. Hello. Uh, Are we hearing each other? I hear you. I hear you, too. Well, that's good. Oh, okay. Okay, that's about all we get. There's nobody else here to make any sounds except for Jarvis, and he's busy producing this show. Uh Um. So let's talk a little, you know, at, well, we can tell our audience, I've, we've known each other for many years, and... Um, I wanted to ask you where, do, do you remember where and how we met? Because I don't, it's so long ago, I don't even remember. Well, luckily, I wore my memory today, and it was through Hearts and Voices. Oh my gosh, that really does go back. Yes, it does. Um, for you, that was a wonderful organization for people that don't know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that uh, musicians went around uh, to sing for AIDS patients in the hospitals 
around New York City. Yeah, we had and, seven um, hospitals that we booked every mm-hmm. week with two singers and an accompanist. Um, right. And that's how I first heard your song. And I was, uh-huh. I was, so, I mean, uh, what a funny boy he is. And um, I really, really, really wanted to try and sing it. And then you laid the sheet music on me and you had written the sweetest thing, which was that you liked the way I sang your song. So uh, uh-huh. how could I not love you? <laughs> uh-huh. Well, thank you for giving exposure to my music. You know, that's what all songwriters want is their songs to be sung. And, um, and thank you for remembering that because that really does bring back a long ago time. It was, that was, um, I had just moved to New York. So Mm. we're talking, it was right after Sammy passed away. So it was maybe, uh, 91, 92. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a while back. Um, so tell me what's going on with you now. Give our audience a little idea of what your groove is. And Well, thank you, first of all, for the lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I'm a person who wears many hats, which, you know, when you're as follically challenged as I am. Uh, <laughs> um, we should yeah, all be that I, challenged. I, I accompany people. I musical direct people. Um, I arrange, I compose. So, yeah, I, I keep busy doing a variety of musical activities. And between all the the singers I work with, uh, I stay pretty busy. Do but, yeah, mostly coaching? what I do is I work with singers in different capacities. Right, right. Um, and a snake. I ha- What is your snake's name? Oh, I have a pet. I have a, uh, I have a, a lovely pet <laughs> corn oh, snakes. She's an all-American corn snake, and her name is Petula. Well, of course and it is. Be- before Petula, I had a king snake named Brooks who passed away. And um, after he passed away, I w- went to a reptile fair up in Westchester, and Anne Hampton Calloway's partner, Kari, went to meet me there. And she's from Arizona, and she's a little phobic about snakes because she grew Imagine. up in a place where they had... <laughs> venomous snakes like rattlesnakes so she was a little wary but she was fascinated and i was so impressed that she wanted to learn more about snakes and you know she was willing to go to this place where there were going to be all these displays of you know reptiles being sold so sure, we I'm spent glad a lovely you found somebody in to go. Chester, <laughs> and i found this beautiful little corn snake for sale uh, and i was reaching for my credit card and kari put her hand on mine and she said put that away she said ann and i want to replace your deceased snake with this new one that you want and we're buying it for you and i said are you kidding me and she bought petula for me so and how I think old of is Kari petula and, and now petula's aunt you know she's sort of like uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah she was a lovely gift from them and uh, so i've had her for about three years now and she's thriving and she's a very nice uh, low maintenance relationship <laughs> I like that idea. That's pretty cool. Um, let me ask you this. Did you always know that music was going to be your path? Did you come from a musical family? Where does this all start from? Because it seems uh, like... Oh, good question. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, grew up, I grew up around music and, and developed an early fascination with music. But I wouldn't say that I always knew it would be my path because i had many passions growing up i also loved to write i loved to draw i loved you know a lot there were a lot of things that you know i loved animals uh, nature so you know if depending upon what day you asked me when i was a kid you know i might i might say i wanted to be a pianist or i might say i wanted to be a fashion illustrator or i might say i wanted to be an architect or i might want to do something with you know snakes or you know it just sort of would depend on what day you asked me but eventually music became my main focus and my dad is a pianist uh though he's not a professional pianist he plays beautifully and plays all the time so that was probably my first influence you know when i was really little is just listening to my dad play the piano and as soon as i could reach the keys i began to you know, play, you know, pick out little melodies, pick amazing? out tunes. 
and play things by ear. If I heard something on the radio or in a movie, if I could hum it in my head, I could go over to the piano and you know figure it out. And I started actual piano lessons when I was about six and a half. Wow. Yeah. And my mom uh, also played a little bit, but um, it was mostly my dad who I heard playing piano. But uh, my mom liked to sing. She, again, not a professional musician. She was a housewife, but she had, had a lovely voice. And both my parents were very much into classical music. And what's really wonderful is that they would take me and my older brother, who's a year older than I am, from the time that we were very small, they would take us to, you know, see a, a you know, a, a musical play or a musical movie, and they would have classical music playing on the radio, you know, in the house, and, um, you know, they listened to, you know, Broadway cast albums and, you know, opera, and so they exposed us to a lot of music when we were little. Yeah, I, um... I also had, a, well, I lived primarily with my mom, and she loved music. There was always music playing in the apartment, and I grew up in Chicago. And um, I can even remember, I must have been eight or nine years old, and mother decided, just on a whim, we were going to New York. Okay, mom, why are we going to New York? Well, you need to hear Judy Garland sing. So, oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, so... I, I she took me to that. And then I think that was at the Black Felt <laughs> Forum, or the Green Felt Forum. Sorry about that, but that was a long uh -huh. time. You got ago. to hear Garland live when you were a kid. I, that's why I wanted to become a singer. I like that action. Oh my goodness, what a great story! Do, do you rem you still remember it? Of course, you don't forget. That. Yeah, indelible. How old were you? Were you Nine. Know? Yeah, that's such a formative. Well, ages, I was already a when member. When you're nine, ten, yeah. I was already a member of the Jack and Jill players in Chicago, and of um, oh dear, uh, the improv group. Um, isn't this terrible? Bradlings. Oh, oh, uh, Second City. Second City for children. I was a Second City child. My goodness. Yeah, and then uh, left Chicago. So the showbiz bug bit you early. Very. Well, the other thing is I so can't what, what, type. So I had a, I've never been able to find a job that pays benefits because I can't type. You mentioned that because my dad was um, a journalist. When I was born, he was a newspaper man. And then when we were four and a half, um, we left Ohio, which is where I was born. And we moved to uh, outside of Washington, D.C., and my dad switched jobs, and he left the world of journalism, and he gave me an old typewriter, and I taught myself how to type on this old typewriter, and that's when I, you know, I love to write stories and, you know, creative writing and stuff like that, so I taught myself to type. I still don't. No, <laughs> so no, I, I, I went the yellow I legal really pads. quickly, but I don't type correctly. Like, if anybody who really, like, learned how to type correctly, if they saw me type, they would think it looked really weird, but that's because... I just figured it out myself, and I just use whatever finger is closest. I don't. I never was taught how to do it. Well, I I just get confused because every time I think I know where all of those <laughs> letters are, they're not there anymore. They've moved. So I sneaky. I've just. Oh, my taking. <laughs> they're they're giving me cues here to do things, and what I need to do right now is to ask you to give me a minute here while I take care of a little business, and then we'll be back to you. So hang on in, hold that thought, and when we cut return, I want to know about being mentored by the likes of Stephen Soundtime. Arthur Lawrence, Stephen Schwartz, Leonard Bernstein, and of course, Compton and Green. So hold those thoughts and we'll be back to you in 60 seconds. Okay. Since when did experience become something to hide? I say we own it. Lose all that negativity. Just let it go. It's just bad energy. Oh, and lose those terrible black balloons they give you on your 50th. What's up with that? Hey, we hear you. That's why our members love AARP The Magazine. It celebrates you with fun and provocative content, from lifestyle and entertainment to in-depth reporting. And it's just one of the great benefits of membership. If you don't think this is right for me when you think AARP, then you don't know ours. Get to know us at aarp.org possibilities. 
to be at peace with myself is the most prominent thing, and I am at peace with myself. I didn't build this deck, I'm just playing the game. <laughs> That's all. That's it. Meals on Wheels has given me a mode of freedom that I wouldn't have otherwise. I've been making sure they get the nutrition that I need, and it's a balanced meal. My name is Maurice McGriff. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. You are tuned in to the Bonnie Shear Show, Boomer Life, and we have the pleasure of chatting with Alex Ryback. Join the conversation, call 323-843-2826, or you can tweet the hashtag BShareRadio. Let's pick up where we left off with Alex right before the break. Alex, let's talk Bye. a little bit about what we had what I had just mentioned. I mean, what an incredible, I mean, it's, it would be like for me having tutelage from Judy. Um, but to it was be, amazing. Yeah. I, I moved to, to New York city almost right out of college. Um, I graduated from Oberlin college in the spring of 1980 and spent one more summer working at a theater in the DC area. And then the fall of 1980, I moved to New York city which is where I still live. And, you know, they say timing is everything. Unbeknownst to me, when I moved to New York, NYU was starting, they were starting up a brand new two-year graduate program for musical theater composers, lyricists, and librettists. And they came after me with scholarship money. <laughs> um, the last thing that I was Business. thinking about at that moment was continuing my education and going to grad school. I wasn't interested in it, wasn't thinking about it. But then I heard about this program, and like I said, they kind of came after me. Um, and when I found out that the faculty was going to be Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince <laughs> and Stephen Schwartz and Julie Stein and, you know, basically all the people that Small invented names what we do, right. <laughs> um, how could I say no? And um, so, of course, I said, you know, where do I sign up? And so for the next two years, I was in the very first class of this program, which continues to this day, the NYU musical, Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program. Wow. And, um, yeah, we were mentored by Prince and Sondheim and Combin and Green and Arthur Lawrence and Stephen Schwartz and uh, Michael Bennett came to talk to us and Leonard Bernstein uh, taught us for a couple weeks. Yeah, it was just incredible. That's amazing. I mean, every day, it, you know, you would just sort of wake up and pinch yourself and go, I can't believe I'm about to play my music for, you know, Leonard Bernstein. It was also kind of horrifying, you know. I mean, if you can imagine being, you know, like 21 years old, it was it was pretty frightening and intimidating. Um you know, they would give us these assignments, and it would be... Could you tell us about an example of one of those assignments that they would ask you to complete? Well, the first one <laughs> the first one was so memorable. Before the program really took off, they had... Um, they did sort of a trial run of what, you know, the, the, the people, the powers that be at NYU sort of wanted to see what it would be like. So they picked uh, a group of us that were already you know, it's going to be in the program. And there was a, a, a little um, kind of trial run. And uh, Stephen Sondheim was, you know, the teacher. And we got our assignments in the mail. And for the purposes of the class, they split us into two groups. Half of us were composers. Half of us were lyricists. And if you did both, if you were someone that wrote music and lyrics, you, for the point of this assignment, you had to choose one. You couldn't do both. You had to be one or the other. And uh, so I was in the composer half. We get this envelope in the mail, and when we opened the envelope, what was in it was, I'm sure you're familiar with the musical Gypsy. Mm -hmm. And so we there was a scene from Gypsy, and for those of you who know the show, there's a scene in Act Two, which is just before the character uh, of Rose's daughter, who is going to become Gypsy Rose Lee, uh, she does her very first burlesque you know, mm -hmm. strip tease. And it's, you know, a very pivotal moment in the story. And her mother, Rose, you know, kind of put, just before she pushes her out on stage, has this breakup with her boyfriend, Herbie, who's been managing the act. 
and they, they have this fight in the dressing room and, and Rose says, go to hell, Herbie, and she slams the door and then she pushes Louise out on stage. And in the show, it's just a little book scene. It's a very short scene with Herbie and Rose and they have their fight, the door slams, and then we're into you know the reprise of Let Me Entertain You. So they gave us the scene and those of us who were composers got a lyric. And it was a lyric that Stephen Sondheim wrote for the character of Rose at the moment where she slams the door on Herbie and just before Gypsy goes, and before, you know, her daughter Louise goes out and becomes Gypsy Rose Lee. And it was like, you know, obviously there's no song in the show now, but apparently early on there was a song for, for Mama Rose there. And it was a song called Who Needs Him? And it's the Sondheim lyric. And so those of us in the class who were composers, like myself, got the scene, got the lyric, and we had to come up with music. So, you know, that was our assignment. And then later found out that the lyricists in the class, they got an envelope. And in their envelope was the same scene from the book, from the play, dialogue. And instead of getting Sondheim's lyric, they got a cassette. Remember, this was 19... 80, <laughs> they got a cassette, and on it was a piece of music. And, of course, what they were listening to on that cassette was the music that Julie Stein had written for this unknown cut song. But they had no idea what the song was called or what Sondheim, what his Sondheim's lyric was. They just had a, a cassette with some music on it, and they knew it was going to be a song for the character of Rose. So if you understand this, when we all met finally in class, those that was the first time that... Half of us, like myself, who were composers, got to hear what Julie Stein actually had, you know, the way that he had actually set Sondheim's lyrics. And for the lyricists in the class, you know, they had to come up with their own lyrics to this music that was on a cassette, but they had no idea what Sondheim's title or words were. So you can imagine the fear and trepidation. You know, <laughs> we're all working on these songs and have no idea what the real music sounded like or what the real lyrics were. And then it was also the first time that we in the class were meeting each other. It was the very first class because we'd gotten the assignments in the mail. So again, just to add to the anxiety because, you know, we all wanted to show off for each other. We all, all of us in the program had had backgrounds in writing, you know, in college and for some of, some of us even earlier in our lives. So, you know, you want to go in and put your best foot forward and play your favorite song that you've written. Instead, we're struggling with this assignment like i wasn't real crazy with the music i came up with and most of the lyricists weren't too crazy about the words that they were coming up with and then to know like imagine especially for the lyricists knowing that the first class you're going to be meeting stephen sondheim and you're going to be showing him it's pretty daunting. a lyric that, that he had actually written you know that they're, they're writing a song that he actually had written lyrics to and they're going to have to come up to that you know try to come up to something that he had written, but they have no idea what he actually wrote. Can you imagine that? So anyway, that first class happens. We're all, you know, playing, you know, in my case, I play my music and then the lyricists come in and they read their lyrics. And after everybody goes, and there were like 12 people in the class. So it took a while for everybody to play their music and their lyrics. So finally Sondheim said, okay, now you've all heard your song. You know, how do you feel about them? <laughs> And I think, you know, it was unanimous. We also, you know, nobody was, none of the composers were really happy with the music they had written. None of the lyricists were that happy with the lyrics they wrote. Nobody felt they had come up with something really good. And Sondheim said, well, that's the lesson. He said, there's a reason why there's not a song in the show, at that point in the show. He said, we tried to write a song in a moment in the show that doesn't call for a song. And he said, the only reason that song existed when we were writing it was the producer said, you know, you're writing this for Ethel Merman. She's a big star. And we think that the audience wants to hear her sing more. And she sings at the beginning of act two and she sings at the end of act two. And there's not a whole lot for her to sing in the middle. And he said, we were sort of forced to write a song for her. So he said, you know, uh, Julie Stein and I sat down and we wrote this song uh, and none of us really liked it. And he said, I don't even think it went into rehearsal. You know, we just sang it at a meeting and we all agreed it wasn't, it stopped the action. You know, it was better to go right from the fight. It was much more dramatic to push for Ethel Merman to push her daughter on stage and get on with the show. And um, he said, that's a really important lesson for all of you as writers of, in musical theater to know where songs belong and where they don't. And he said, if it's the wrong spot, 
you can't write a good song because it's he said it doesn't matter even if the song was a good song it wouldn't work there because it's stopping the accent so wasn't that you know it's kind of a sadistic assignment because the whole point of the assignment was that none of us would be able to write something <laughs> that was really good <laughs> kind of set you was, off on your on your path we this never is... forgot as you can see we never, never. forgot that lesson you know, never. it made a real impression on us yeah uh, some so that was how the program started and then for the next two years you know, we were just on this amazing roller coaster of, you know, just working with these giants, um, you know, Stephen Schwartz and Martin Chardon and Michael Bennett, and Com we would meet in Betty Comden's living room, and um, yeah, it was it was tremendous. It was I'm so grateful that I had. See, the that's how I feel to, about you. To work with these people. You know, I I really what do you mean? I do. I mean, when you have somebody like yourself, who is such a musicologist, who is such a pro, um, as a singer, it's half of my concern is gone because I don't feel like I'm there alone. And uh, even right. when we did those few moments uh, in the hospitals, I knew it right then and there. But of course, that's why all these wonderful singers want to work with you, and I certainly understand that. Um, That's very nice of you. Well, it's truth. It's truth. Um, well, it it's, should be a partnership. It's my joy to, you know, uh, to work with singers and to make music together. I don't even think of it as like, the singer and the accompanist, you know, it's like we're partners. It's like ballroom dancing. It's, it takes two to make the song happen. It's probably my why job, I like it, you I so much. I think of myself more as a film score. It's like you as the singer are projecting your movie. When you sing those lyrics, you're creating a movie for the audience. And my job is to create the film score in that moment. You know, so every time, I mean, I, I've been very blessed have long-term relationships with singers like Liz Calloway or Faith Prince and you know these are wonderful actresses as well as singers Absolutely. every time they perform uh, Karen Mason another one I've worked with you know for so many years and people like that every time they you, know, you can do with the same piece of material over many years do many many you know countless performances of a particular song but it's different every time it's never completely locked in and that's what keeps it exciting and alive and so it's not just playing notes it's they're creating a, a unique moment it will never be that it will never be the same moment even if you know you're doing that same song the next night in another concert it's a different audience it's a different town it's a different day of the week um you know i i enjoy working with people who create that in the moment experience and to be part of that to help create that you know that's exciting i love that yeah well you just gave me goose bumples all over again alex um uh, we're a little yeah. short on time so let me ask you this can you let our audience know how they can support you how they can follow you are there any gigs coming up in the near future that kind of stuff Oh, gigs. Yes, they're always gigs. Um, well, I have a couple coming up this weekend, in fact. Um, actually, this Saturday, I, there's a, a wonderful singer from St. Louis who just moved to New York. Her name is Katie Dunn McGrath. I'm not playing for her on Saturday, but I wrote a song with her a month ago, and she's premiering it in her act. Okay. And she's performing in New York City this Saturday at the Metropolitan Room, for those of your listeners who are in New York. And the following day, the Sunday, June 4th, I am playing for a wonderful singer named Beth Selter. She's also at the Metropolitan Room in the afternoon at 4. Uh, Karen Akers, who may be more of a familiar name for her work in shows like Grand Hotel and Nine and her many years of starring in you know, her own cabaret acts and all her wonderful recordings, she and I will be performing at the Skytop Music Festival in the Poconos on June 17th, which is a couple weekends away, uh, the day before Father's Day. And then on Father's Day, which is June 18th, I'm performing with Jeff Harner, who's the singer I probably worked with the longest. Um, he and I started working together in, I think, 1982 or 83. 
and we're reprising a Sammy Kahn tribute show that we first did, oh, probably 20 years ago. Oh, um, and we're bringing it back for one night only. Uh, also at the Metropolitan Room in New York City, uh, that's June 18th at 7 o'clock. So those are a few things uh, coming up. And then I would want to tell your listeners that I'm going to be doing a, an evening of my original music. Uh, again, this this is turning into an advertisement for the Metropolitan Room. It sort of uh, sounds it, like it'll, it. But... <laughs> it'll, it's, but it's a great room. Uh, November 30th. Uh, you know, save that date for those who like to plan ahead. Uh, November 30th, I'll be at the Metropolitan Room with a wonderful group of Broadway and cabaret stars um, in an evening of all my original you know, songs. Excellent. So, uh, excellent, so excellent. People that are in the New York area want to come you know, find me and hear me. Uh, you know, they can mark well, those. Well, Alex, down. I know you're on Facebook, so there will probably be some people can check there if they didn't have a pencil Absolutely. and remembered the dates. And I will be more than happy to post this on my Bonnie Sings Lena fan book page on Facebook. Um, well, thank you. And pleasure. I will be launching my own website soon. For some reason, I've not had a website um, all, all this time okay. until now. I have somebody finally putting that together for me. My so, mom, um, may she rest in peace, used to always say to me, I want to be a dot com. And when I first got my, <laughs> yeah, I said, Bonnie, I want to be a dot com. And so, of course, it was such a giggle when we put together Bonnie's share dot com it was like all right ma i heard you now i'm a dot com you can be well, a dot I'm about com, to be a dot com and I'll, I'll join the dot com club so we can be dot coms together that would be terrific um what we're going to do now seeing as we've talked about the fact that your songwriting is so exquisite and again it's the tune that i really related to and i think was really what drew me t to you and um this is your song what a funny boy he is that you wrote with the late michael stewart um and this right. is this is performed by the one and only liz calloway and uh that will be coming up in a minute Actually, in 30 seconds, Alex, Wonderful. thank you so much for spending this time with me today. All the best now and forever. My You're pleasure. Just Thanks a joy. Thank you. Take care. Let's run that song now, okay, Jarvis? Type 1 diabetes can be living in anyone. Type 1 diabetes is when your pancreas doesn't produce insulin. It's not caused by your diet. It's not caused by anything you did. Type 1 diabetes can be very serious. Blindness, amputation. Learn more about type 1 diabetes. Help support JDRF finding a cure. T1D looks like my brother. T1D looks like a friend. Type 1 diabetes looks like me.
Bonnie Share Show, Boomer Life. My co-host for this segment has been with us once before, a lovely woman, and of course, a member of the T1D community, uh, living right here in California. Uh, welcome, Lisa Hepner. Thank you. Great to see you. Um, Lisa, you're living with T1D Give me a little bit of your story. Share with the audience your perspective of your of your life with T1D. Got it. Uh, well, I've had type 1 for 25 years. I was diagnosed uh, living abroad at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland when I was 21. So I was diagnosed a little later in life. And I'm 46 now. And uh, I'm really tired of this disease. <laughs> really? <laughs> I won't, uh, you know, pardon the pun. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's exhausting. <laughs> and um, I have a little guy at home, a sweet yes, son. Oh, how cute is he, Jack? Jack. Oh. He's two. And... Could eat him with a spoon. <laughs> Cheeks. Oh. So he, he's a doll. And, uh, but I noticed that, you know, having a toddler now, uh, it takes a lot of attention, and I and oh, like <laughs> almost as much attention as the diabetes does. Huh? That's right. So, so you, you live a very attentive life. Exactly, and I just read somewhere. I think it was in Beyond Type One a post that, you know, Type One diabetes is that other kid, right? It's that other child in the room. That's an interesting light. Yeah, yeah, that requires a lot of attention, and you know, when I'm faced with like my cute son Jack or my annoying Type One. You know, sometimes I'm like picking my son Jack more most of the time over, you know, looking um, after my type one as well as I should. So I'll just be honest with you. It's it's hard. And it doesn't go away. Not when it's 18, not when it's 21. It doesn't go into the military. It do <laughs> doesn't go off to college. No. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> With all this looping stuff that I've been hearing about, I need another degree just to figure that out. Yeah, I don't know. What, what's looping? Oh, that's the do-it-yourself artificial pancreas. Oh, got it. I mean, it's the like the bionic pancreas that talks to Yeah, itself. but... Yeah. Yeah. Interesting the closed system. But, yeah, but, yeah right. but I mean, there are people who really understand what they're talking about. Not I. <laughs> Not I. I mean, uh, no, <laughs> I just right. don't do that. But one thing that uh, really fascinates me is your background, not as a T1, but as a documentary filmmaker. And uh, this, of course, is my way of getting to ask you about your latest work entitled The Human Trial. Uh, can you tell us what that's all about? I got the human and the trial. <laughs> 
Right. So a clinical trial is when humans actually are testing out a drug or device that's been approved by the FDA or another regulatory agency. So literally the human trial refers to a clinical trial in humans, first in humans, sometimes it's called. So the human trial is a documentary feature we've been working on for the past hmm, four years. And we are following uh, a bunch of researchers at a company in San Diego called Viasite in their quest to cure type 1 using um, embryonic stem cell derived cells, islet cells. And uh, it's not just about Viasite, it's also um, asking some pretty big questions like why haven't there been more cures in the last 100 years? Why is type 1 or why is diabetes the redheaded stepchild disease that doesn't get much popular culture attention? And why are we still talking about the morality of stem cell research? It's 2017. Now, there's a lot going on right now at the White House, which makes you question <laughs> a lot of sanity. Uh, well, obviously, we just heard about Trump pulling out of the climate accord in Paris. Uh, disheartening. Um, but... Anyway, so so this film is asking some really, um, uh, I think, important questions, especially now uh, with you know the, who's you know in the White House and and that impact that it's having on um, scientific science. and medical research, science in general. You know, the um, Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price is on the record. Uh, he, that he's against embryonic stem cell research or stem cell research in general. He feels it's morally wrong. Uh, the vice president, Mike Pence, is one of the biggest opponents to stem cell research. And in fact, when Obama uh, lifted the ban on the stem cell research that George W. Bush put in place, I think in 2002, um, it was uh, Vice President Pence who was most on record um, criticizing do you Obama. Think, do you think maybe that's why 45 wanted to bring in these people? They already were clear. Um, and although I don't do a lot of this on this show, um, I'm still troubled by those folks who said to me and have said to others, Oh, well, you just wait and see. Mm -hmm. Well, I've waited and I've seen, and I don't like it any better. If it's possible to like it less, I'm liking it less. Um, you know, and on the whole issue of the stem cell uh, transplantation, we have a, a friend in common who has gone through the procedure not with via site, but here in the Los Angeles area, City of Hope. Um, you know, people will write, oh, but what about, you know, they, they love the idea, but oh boy, what about the... The anti-rejection drugs? I, I don't know about you. If they would take me, I'd go in a mess. <laughs> You know, I do. I, no, probably, I, my, I would send. I, mean, I think it's a really good topic for us as type ones to talk about this, and what does it mean to live for the rest of your life on immunosuppressant drugs, and and, what's, and how what's different is it than us? living the rest of your life on insulin? Right. The same drug that can help us can also kill us. Mm -hmm. So where then is a the differential there? Right. I, 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 I totally agree I mean, with I, you. I mean, I, I think that... Um, do you know... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think that the immunosuppressant cocktail, drug cocktails, have come a long way um, in the past decade. I think they're less harmful and less invasive to the immune system. Um, ironically enough, one of our interns at my production office had a liver transplant. And he's, he's a young guy, 21. You know, my heart goes out to him. But he's on immunosuppressant drugs. So I talk to him all the time about it and like, how are you feeling? What's going on? And I do think there must, there's probably a difference in the uh, regime. It probably goes with what was transplanted. You know what I mean? Like what he's on as a liver transplant recipient would probably be different than what we'd be on as an islet cell recipient. 
I'm not positive, but uh, you know he. Well, in his case, he really was on you know his deathbed, and there was only one choice, and that was the transplant. But he seems to be living uh, quite a healthy and full life. Let me ask you this: other than the bio hub that they're working on at uh, the Diabetes Research Institute. Um, are there currently that you know of any studies in transplantation yet where the immunosuppression drugs are not necessary? Or is really the bio hub the first move toward that? Yeah, no, no, there isn't any other one so without that- immunosuppressants. I mean, uh, Beta O2, a company in Israel, is doing islet cell transplants, and they're they're actually pumping in oxygen to keep those islet cells alive. God it, bless these people. <laughs> Israel and I a, can't type. A, a lot of innovation. <laughs> they're doing a lot of good stuff. Well, you know, that, but that, that leads me also, and I even talked to you about this when I had Andy Drexler on. Um, who, for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Drexler is an endocrinologist, a fine endocrinologist, and just as a little coinky dinky, mm-hmm. both of us both Melissa and myself have seen Dr. Drexler. Um, and uh, the question at that time was, well, do we have the science? And mm-hmm. he happened to nod a little bit, but the answer was no, we don't really cure anything. Is transplantation a cure? I think it's a functional cure. I think it's a functional cure that is defined by not having to take insulin and by not having to uh, test your sugars every hour on the hour. You know, I think the quality of life is also a measurement. And, you know, you mentioned our friend in common who's had an islet cell transplant. Well, he seems to be the happiest guy on the planet. I know. Since going off insulin. And and yet, um, you know, they only, the study only pays for your drugs for so long. And then Mm -hmm. the patient needs to take that responsibility on. And it's not cheap. So even if they could garner 60 million stem cells a week, how do you keep this up? So again, Mm -hmm. when I hear cure, that means I walk out the door, I'm done with this. That's not happening so fast. you know, I think, um, you know, we when we spoke last time, I think Visite was going into their first iteration of the trial for the VCO1, where they were addressing all of the problems with islet cell transplantation, not just the source, right, which has always been a problem, but also the immunosuppressant drugs. And how do you stop your body from rejecting this organ? Uh, be, right, exactly. Right. And so, so they had a thicker membrane. And uh, the patient did not require taking any immunosuppressant drugs. You know, they realized along the way that they think it'll work more effectively if there is a more porous membrane around the islet cells. And thus, there needs to be some sort of Remember protection. Remember, you're talking to the girl can't yeah. type, okay? <laughs> okay. But it's I, more I hole, It's like saying. a tea bag. It's like a bigger tea bag, right? Bigger tea bag with more holes. And Now, that's a concept <laughs> I can understand. Right. So the bigger tea bag has more flavor, right? But you've got to protect it from, you know, getting blocked up with stuff that stops the flavor from going uh, yeah. anyway my metaphor is failing me no i i understood it <laughs> um you know and this is not a new concept to try to encapsulate these cells um there was a researcher at usc school of medicine his name was sam bestman and um that's actually where i interned was with him and and what he was doing at that time, let's see, I was this is probably the very early seventies. Um, he had me on a spectrophotometer, looking at. I mean, he brought in his wife's girdle, anything you could think of. We tested to see what would. So this is not new, and I think it's important that people understand that nothing is going to happen overnight. And, of course, you want it to be as, look, you can't guarantee anything in life is what I, is what I believe. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that being said, I would do it in a minute. 
you know, I'm, I This is my you. 50th year now of being a T1. Um, I, I didn't wow. get a gold watch or anything. You gotta let, I, wait, you gotta let getting, Jocelyn know that because jo- they give out medals. Yes, I know. I was actually a patient at Jocelyn in the very early days. I think I was 19 at the time. And I didn't want to go into another hospital. But my mother said, Bonnie, I'll tell you what. I was I had just been booked on the Barbara McNair show. This was going to be my first television singing appearance. And she said to me, if you go to the Jocelyn Clinic for a week when we leave uh, Toronto, which is where they shot in those days, um, I'll buy you any dress you want. <laughs> Bribery always works. Yeah, it's a good move, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I could talk to you for hours and hours, and I think what we need to do is get you back again oh, and ask it. some questions. Um, please tell our audience how they can follow you and sure and your projects. Absolutely. Yeah. And, so um, the film is called The Human Trial. You can go to our website, thehumantrial.com. We have these amazing T-shirts that Shepard Ferry, um, also a type one, has designed for us. And he also designed our posters. So we have some signed limited edition prints. If you want to support the film, go on the website and you can purchase these uh, so T-shirts or the poster. So thehumantrial.com. Thehumantrial.com. You can follow us on Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook. Boy, you're just a little tweet and full. <laughs> I have someone who does this because I'm clueless. I, I doubt that, but I, I say the same thing. I don't say that you're yeah. clueless. I, yeah, no, I'm clueless. I'm still trying to figure out Dropbox, but that's another story <laughs> for another time. I can get you in, but how do I get you out and put you back? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Lisa, um, again, thank you so very much for taking the time to come and talk with me today. And uh, be well, huh? <laughs> Always fun to see you, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, oh wait, there's one more little thing I'm supposed to let you all know. If any of you other T1Ds would like to sit over in this chair and be my Type 1 co-host, it's so easy. All you have to do is write to me, bonnie at bonnieshare.com, and I'll give you a date and we'll do it. That's how easy it is. Um, Next up, Boomer News and some views from my soapbox. Back in 30 seconds. Thank you, Lisa. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a social worker. When I found out that I had hepatitis C, I was a single mother, and I was absolutely terrified. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, estimates there are close to 3 million baby boomers infected with hepatitis C. Because there can be no symptoms for decades, most don't even know it. But if detected in time, Hep C can be cured, and the treatment is simple. Today I feel great. I'm a healthy 65-year-old, I bike to work, I go to the gym, and I've cleared the virus. The CDC is urging everybody born between 1945 and 1965 to get tested. It's an easy one-time blood test that may be covered by insurance. I got a disease that could have killed me, but I saved my own life by getting tested. Don't wait. Ask your doctor about getting tested for Hep C. Because knowing is everything. Today's Boomer News comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. The economic impact when baby boomers retire. Check this out. The decision to retire is one of the most important personal financial decisions anyone can make. Well, it turns out that it also has a profound macroeconomic impact that we are only now beginning to appreciate. Economists have known for a long time that as the U.S. population ages, it'll tend to slow down economic growth just because we'll have a smaller workforce as a result. But there's new evidence that suggests there's another impact on the economy that's potentially even more important. Because older workers tend to be the most knowledgeable and the most experienced, when they retire, that hurts the productivity of everybody left behind. And that drags on the economy through productivity growth. These findings come from a new economic research paper that just came out in the last week. The economists looked at all 50 states, they looked at the ones that aged faster, and they found that in those states, economic growth slowed more. 
about a third of the slowdown was because their workforce wasn't growing as quickly, but the rest of it was because the remaining workers just weren't as productive. You know, this kind of makes sense. Older workers aren't just the ones who are most experienced and capable, they also tend to make the people around them more capable and more confident and knowledgeable about how to do their jobs. If you look around the country right now, there are employers from coast to coast grappling with the fact that some of their most experienced employees are now coming up on retirement and they're very worried about how to replace them. There's a lot of sort of tribal knowledge that you acquire on the job that you cannot simply teach in college. The country as a whole needs to come to grips with this because if it doesn't, it's facing a double whammy from the aging of the population. This, I think, adds an extra impetus to a lot of the discussion now that we should do more to extend retirement ages, both in private pensions and in Social Security. And now, um, some of the views from my soapbox, you know, the ones who I think get it right and those who should honestly be ashamed of themselves. Um, <clears throat> so beginning, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, the victims of the Portland train attack uh, for being true American heroes. These men were defending two women, um, one of whom was wearing um, a high job, and, uh, and they were the targets um, and uh, there were three men um, who tried to come to their defense. Two of them were killed, and one is recuperating. Um, makes me proud to be an American. And then my shout-down. Um, Medicare and its beneficiaries aren't the winners um, in the behind-the-scenes rebate game being played by drug makers, health insurers, and pharmacy benefit managers, according to a paper published last Tuesday in the Journal of American Medicine, Internal Medicine. You might want to read it. Um, now, before we say goodbye, I'd like to thank today's guests, Alex Ryback. And the lovely Lisa Hepner. That's our show, and I hope you'll return next week for another, I went a little long today, normally 50 minutes of fun. So um, until then, please visit BonnieShare.com. Follow the number one Bonnie Share on Twitter. And I uh, like the Bonnie Sings Lena fan page on Facebook. Um, this show also streams live on that page. Um, now, finally, many of you are aware of the very special role that Sammy Davis Jr. played in my early life. Um, he was my friend. He was my mentor. And so I end every show sort of Carol Burnett style with a wink and a nod to you, Mr. D. See y'all next week.